Hi everyone, Anthony Morganti here. Recently, Adobe updated Lightroom Classic 2 version 14. In today's video, we're going to take a look at what's new and exciting in this, the latest version of Adobe Lightroom Classic. Now, historically, whenever a software company comes out with a whole number update, say from version 13 to version 14, that means something significant has been added to the application. And usually, Adobe would release these whole number updates for all of their applications in October to coincide with the conference they sponsor called Adobe Max. Well, this October has been no different. Adobe has released a whole number update to Lightroom Classic. I think it went from 13.7 to 14. Most of us were expecting something significant to be added to this version of Lightroom Classic. Unfortunately, there really hasn't been anything significant added. There have been a few things, and I am going to go over them in this video. Now, one of the new things really isn't a new thing. It's something that has been in Lightroom for a few months, but it was under early access. Specifically, it had to do with the Remove tool. If we go up to the Remove tools in general by clicking on the little eraser, there are three Remove tools. And for a long time, there's been the Clone tool and the Heal tool. And then a little over a year ago, they added the remove tool. That's this tool right here. Then earlier this year, I think maybe in April or so, they added generative AI to this. So you had the option to use generative AI. Now, as I mentioned, it was in early access. That's kind of like a beta version of the tool. So it was still being developed. It probably wasn't working as well as Adobe hoped it could work. Well, with this version of Lightroom Classic, it is now no longer early access. It has been updated to work as best as it can be with today's technology. So technically, it should work really well now. Now, when should you use generative AI and when you should not? If you want to remove, let's say, sensor spots, or maybe someone has a pimple, or maybe just like a branch or a leaf is jutting out into the frame, then use the remove tool without generative AI. That way, it will be very fast. You can just paint on something like this leaf right here and let go, and it will remove it very quickly. But if you need to remove anything more complex, and specifically anything that might be behind something else, for example, we have this chewed up bucket behind the lion's head. And if I don't use generative AI for this, and I just paint around, let's say, the outside of the bucket and come down and then go around the head of the lion, just make sure I get all the bucket and then get the middle part because you got to paint in the middle too. What it, what it does, the way this tool works is it, use con, it uses content aware fill. So when I let go, it looks at other pixels in the image to reference and then kind of copies pixels in that area to get rid of whatever you want it to get rid of. And you could see in this case, it did a very poor job because it's using pixels that are in the image. So you can see some of the furs in the background here. So it just doesn't look right. So let's get rid of that. So I mentioned that uh, this past spring, uh, they added content um, or they added generative functionality to it. And specifically, you could click this box and use generative AI. And when you do, it will actually send the image up to Adobe servers. And then Adobe servers will do whatever magic it can do to get rid of the bucket but leave our line intact. Now, if I do not have detect objects checked and I just paint around the outside like I did, it will just put the overlay exactly where I painted. And you may want that for some situations. You could add or subtract from your selection. But if you do have a discernible object that you're trying to remove, as I am trying to remove this bucket, what you should do is also click detect objects. Then you could do it very quickly. You could go around the perimeter of, of the bucket like this, down the edge of the head, uh, lion's head, just close it off, and then when you let go, it will find the bucket and put an overlay there. Now you could see it's, it's selecting more than the bucket. That's okay, but you still have the option to add or subtract from the selection. Now I'm a little nervous because it's selecting a lot of the lion, and I want as much of the lion to be as original as possible. So I'm going to subtract from the selection around the line a little bit. I could click on the select button here and get a select brush, but an easier way is just hold in the option key on a Mac, alt key on a PC, and you'll temporarily switch over to the subtract brush as long as you hold that key in. So I'm going to come in here and subtract 
from this area where it's more on the lion. And I'll get a smaller brush. I'm using the left bracket key to get a smaller brush. You could get a large brush with the right bracket key. And I'm just going to get more of his ear there. So I just feel better about that. So when I'm ready, I'll click remove. What it will do, just like Photoshop's generative AI, it will send it up to Adobe servers. Adobe servers will do all the heavy lifting. And every now and then you'll get this generative remove failed. And what I found if that happens is to cancel it, then go back to it like again, and I'll just do it very quickly with the same thing, same same uh, settings, and uh, go around the outside of here. Every now and then you'll get that, particularly like how I modified it, and I took it away from part of the lion. This time I won't take it away from the lion. It will probably work. If you try to minimize it by using the subtract brush too much, it will sometimes do that. So we'll just click remove and let it you know, regenerate much of the lion. So there, you can see just as it is, it is much better than the remove tool without generative AI at all. And you get three variations. You could just click this right arrow to go through the three variations. There's one, there's two, and there's three. And they pretty look similar. Back here is different on the third one, the second one, and the first one. I think the first one looks the best but it's really up to you which one you use. Uh, you could, if if none of those three look good to you, you could click generate again and get another example of it, or three more examples of it, I should say. But you can see how it works very well. Now, as I mentioned, this really isn't new. This was in Lightroom Classic for several months. They've just refined it, and it's ready for full release without the early access label any longer. Now, something that is new which I kind of like, actually. Uh, it's something simple, though. If we go up to File, you'll notice that there is that option here to rename your catalog. Um, often, uh, when you come out with a Lightroom or, or Adobe releases a Lightroom update, the catalog has to get updated. And the way they do it is they copy your existing catalog and give the new catalog, the updated catalog, a new name. Now, a lot of times, you'll have all these files with names and stuff like this. Um, so you could now have the option is after it does that, you could rename it. Uh, so you could just rename it anything you like. I like to use catalogs for a year. So I have Lightroom 2024. In January, I'll start a new catalog called Lightroom 2025. That's because I take a lot of photos. So I, I don't want my catalogs to get so large like I used to. I had like 60, 70,000 images in a catalog. Then Lightroom runs really slow when you have a lot. So now I create a new catalog every year and I just when I need to go back, I go to my old catalog. For some reason, I can do it. But my point here is you could now rename the catalog that is new. Another thing, which is a minor thing, is if we go up to catalog settings. On a Mac, it's under the Lightroom Classic menu. On a PC, it's under the Edit menu. Go to catalog settings, uh, and you go to the Previews tab. Um, in the past, as far as one-in-one -one previews are concerned, which take up a lot of disk space, you had this drop-down, and you could delete one-to-one -one previews like once a day or once a week or after 30 days. I always had mine set to 30 days. So if I did create a one-to-one -one preview, it would be there for 30 days. Then on the 31st day, Lightroom will automatically delete it. Now you have the option to just give yourself a cache size. So in this case, it's going to default to 20 gigabytes. So what it will do is when you create a one-on-one -on -one preview, um, it will save it. And once you go over 20 gigabytes, though, of one-to-one -one previews, it will start to delete your oldest ones. So you may prefer that, particularly if you do use a lot of one-to-one -one previews and you often need them longer than 30 days, but you don't want them forever. So you could do this. You could just click that and I would leave it for now. For me, it's up to you how big your hard disks are. I leave it at 20 gigabytes. So that is new as well. Now, this final new update, uh, again, I mentioned there's not a lot new here. Uh, it has to do with content credentials. Uh, you may be familiar this was added to Photoshop about a year ago, maybe last October. Uh, it's now in Lightroom Classic, and this is still in early access. So if I want to export this image, now I did some work on it, right? So I did the um, erase tool. I used generative AI on it, and I did some editing, basic editing here. That's all I really did to it, right? 
So let's export it. I'm going to bring up the export dialog. And I have it kind of set up already, a uh, custom name Lion. But if we scroll down, and this is for JPEGs only, it won't uh, use content credentials on any other file type, only JPEGs, at least right now. Uh, if we go here, you could see it says early access. And what content credentials are is it will add data either to the image, to the cloud, or both that basically say what you did to the image. Let me show you. So we go here and I say I want to publish the content credentials only to the cloud. Then when I export the image, the image won't have the content credentials added to it. It will only be in the cloud, but you'll be able to reference it. And I'll show you how to do that in a minute. Or you could have it only attached to the file. So it won't get added to the cloud, but it will be on the file only. Or you could do both. And I'm going to do both for this image just to show you. Now, what do you want to add? Well, I'm going to add my name who it is. You may not want to add your name, uh, your specific name, for whatever reason. Then connected accounts. Uh, this here, I'm going to click it on. But if you go to manage, it will bring you to Adobe and your account on Adobe. And you could specifically connect specific accounts. You could see I connected Behance, I don't know how you say that, and X to my account. I could do Instagram as well. And I could do LinkedIn as well if I wanted to. So I could add those um, to uh, the account, or I could go down here with these Web3 options as well. Now, what that means is it's not going to uh, automatically post this image to Twitter or post this image to Behance or post the image to Instagram. It's just going to have the content credentials there because they're, I guess, working with Adobe on this content credentials thing. So it's just there, and it's not something you could look at. You can't log into your Twitter account or X account and look at content credentials, but it's there, right? And all right, so we got that, and this, let's just export it. Let me show you what I mean. So we're going to export it. Now I have it on the file, and I have it so that it's, it's in the cloud as well. What you could do then is you could go to this website, and this website here um, I'll have linked in the description below your uh, below this video. You could check the content credentials on an image. So I'll select a file, and I have this lion, right? So we'll upload the lion. And when it does, you could see over here it's showing that it was produced by me. I have social media accounts. Now, the reason why you may want to use a social media account, you might have a very common name. Let's say your name is John Smith, unfortunately. <laughs> a very common name. Uh, and... Let's say uh, instead of Twitter, let's just use Instagram as an example. Let's say there's like 30 John Smiths or 300 John Smiths on Instagram and you want to you want people to know which John Smith actually created the image. And you may even have the image up there as well. Well, they could click on this then and go to your Instagram account. In my case, it would be Twitter and Behance. They could go to those accounts and see who I am and it, you know, will kind of uh, make sure that they're speaking to the right Anthony Morganti or the right John Smith. So that's why. Now you'll notice I use Lightroom Classic 14.0. Uh, AI tool used Adobe Firefly. I removed the bucket from behind the um, the lion's head. And then I did color and exposure edits. I did drawing edits like brushes and so on. I opened a pre-existing file and so on. The, here's the actual file I used, which is a Nikon RAW file. Now, another reason why content credentials are probably going to come into play in the future is for contests. So there may be a contest and they don't want any Photoshop entries. Uh, you know, it might be whatever. And for whatever reason, they don't want any, they don't want you to use uh, anything to remove, you know, Adobe Firefly, anything like that. And you may have to have content credentials for that image so they could check it and make sure that you only did color and exposure edits to it in drawing edits, you know, like pencils, like for mine, the drawing edits where I use masking to sharpen the lion. So that's why that is showing up there. Um, I didn't resize the image. I'm not sure why, at least I don't think I did, but point is, uh, it will allow third parties to know what you did to that image. Now, what happens if, for example, let's go down here. I have this image here. I exported this image earlier today and I had contact credentials on the file and I had it, the content credentials loaded to the crowd, cloud, 
Let's say what would happen if some nefarious person got your image and and scraped the content credentials off it, right? And then they're showing it as their own. Well, it's actually still searchable if you save those content credentials to the cloud. For example, let me export this image, but I'm not, um, I'm going to call it Fredo. It's our dog. Nah, it's not a lion. And I'm not going to use content credentials this time. So don't include, we're not going to include any content credentials at all. And we're going to export it. So this is just as though you exported an image from Lightroom a few weeks ago before content credentials were available. So I'm going to select another device now because I did export this image in the past with content credentials. What will happen is it won't find anything, but then you could go over here and search for possible matches. And then what it will do, it will find every instance of it. And here, here's one right here, possible match. And there it is. And this is showing the bay hunts, uh, where the, the content credentials are caught on, or kept on bay hunts. And here is the Twitter or X, uh, where one, and you can see what I did to this and this one too, I used Firefly. There was a, if I give you a before after here. I see this thing on the left that was, uh, I think my camera bag was right there. And you could see I removed that. So there's before and after. So that's content credentials. Again, it's not um, earth shattering. Uh, probably 90% of us aren't going to use it. I don't need to use it really for any reason that I could think of. But maybe down the line, it will come in handy. So you could prove an image is actually yours. Uh, then you have that. Uh, kind of like as, uh, as um, you know, a way to prove it. Uh, but, you know, take it for what it's worth. But again, in the description uh, below this video, I'll have links to some of Adobe's content uh, credentials, uh, information they have on their website uh, so that you could read up on it a little bit more, including this, um, this uh, specific, this specific uh, page where you could check the content credentials of an image. So that's it. That's really all that's new in this version of Lightroom Classic. I do want to apologize. Typically in the past, when any application that I do videos on, when they come out with a new version, I try to do this what's new video the day it came out, but I've been very busy and I really haven't been able to get this done. i really late to the party. I know there's probably been dozens of other uh, people that have uploaded what's new in this version of Lightroom already, and you probably watch those videos. If you are watching mine as well, I do appreciate it. Thank you very much. I hope to be uh, propped next time and get these videos done much sooner. I'm going to be doing a video on the desktop version of Lightroom. Uh, I think it's version 8 now. And I'm going to be doing what's new in the uh, current version of Photoshop, Photoshop 2025. So look at look for those in the next few days. Thank you, everyone who watches my videos. I really do appreciate it. Talk to you guys soon.